Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is the Gedalia Meyer, podcasting once again from Israel. The coronavirus pandemic continues here, much to everyone's frustration, as is happening elsewhere in the world. When will this thing end? We are all asking that question, but nobody is giving answers, at least answers that are solid and dependable. It is quite amazing that after over five months of this disease, it seems that the vaunted and invincible world of science still has very little that it really knows for sure. It appears that almost everything they say is nothing more than educated guesswork. Who would have dreamed this possible two decades into the 21st century? If they can tell us what happens in the interior of a proton or what is going on in a black hole millions of light years away, why can't they decipher a relatively simple virus that can be seen directly under a microscope? There are no great answers to these questions. It is certainly frustrating for all of us who are not scientists and have come to rely on science for all the answers. It, it, in a great irony, it, is, it vaguely resembles those times in the past when religion could not provide answers to the great questions about life and people were forced to, to abandon their beliefs and search for something that dealt more directly with whatever those pressing, pressing issues were. Science, of course, and the great trust we have been accustomed, become accustomed to grant it was the result, result of those theological doubts of the relatively recent past. Is science now facing a kind of karma for its usurping of the dominion of religion? Speaking for myself, I really hope not. I believe that science represents a great step forward in the grand human search for knowledge. I hope that it finds answers to the current pandemic and other pressing matters that come into the world in the future. But paralleling this hope, I, I also look forward to the day when science and religion are no longer at loggerheads with each other and each can appreciate the benefits of the other. As Albert Einstein once said, religion without science is blind. Science without religion is lame. This week's Parsha is called Hukat, which means, quote, the law of. This obviously incomplete title is really just the second word of the second sentence in the Parsha, and represents one part of a complete thought. That thought is the statement, this is the law of the Torah. The law is then described in great detail, at least by the normal standards of the Torah describing something. This law deals with the para aduma, or red heifer, the perfectly red cow or calf that played an extremely important role in the ritual purification of the Israelites. Among the details of this red heifer is that every hair on its body must be red. Even one non-red hair invalidates the animal for this purpose. <clears throat> it also must never have carried a yoke, a limitation which was extended to include carrying any weight at all except for its own body weight. <clears throat> it is to be slaughtered by the high priest <clears throat> outside of the main encampment, and then burned to ash. But prior to the burning, some of its blood was sprinkled towards the central shrine of the tabernacle. Then various herbs and other natural products had to be cast onto the ashes. The ashes were then gathered and placed in a specific location to await future use. That future use involved sprinkling these ashes after they had been mixed with water that had not been used for any other purpose, onto any per person who had contact with the corpse and was thus ritually impure. This, it turns out, was the only way that such a person could become purified. This, th thus, this procedure was quite essential in biblical Israel. Such things as entering the tabernacle or the temple, eating of, ver of the various offerings, and several other matters of religious importance could not be done in the ritually impure state. It was only when this mysterious red heifer ceremony, <clears throat> it was only with this mysterious red heifer cer ceremony that any of that could be resolved. Jewish tradition has it that there were only 10 of these red cows in all of Jewish history. The procedure, however, however could have been done even after the last of those cows vanished, since water could be added to existing red heifer water. Unfortunately, 
The last of the water also vanished at some point in the distant past. And we haven't had access to this ceremony for nearly 2,000 years. Some Jews lament this state of affairs, while for others, it is good riddance. The latter group see this as one of the more blatant examples of a Torah ritual that makes no sense, that it, that it is better off being left, uh, very, being left in the wastebasket of antiquated religious ceremonies. What do those who long for the return of this ceremony say to justify their apparently illogical stance of longing for a nonsensical ritual? Before we answer that, it may be important to state a few more of the details of this bizarre procedure. It seems that even though the ashes of the cow are essential for ritual purification, those who were involved in any stage of the preparation of the materials were automatically impurified by virtue of their participation. One might expect the exact opposite, that those who concoct the mixture should be the ultimate in ritually pure. But such is not the case, as is explicitly stated in this Parsha. This is considered to be a major puzzle in the Torah. How could it be that those who prepare the purification are, there, are themselves, themselves made ritually impure? It turns out that the strangeness of this whole ritual is the reason why the Torah entitles this commandment with that key word, hukat which means not simply law, but has the more exact meaning of statute or decree. This word is traditionally understood as suggesting something that is not quite rational and sensible. There, there are laws that are supposed to create or enforce justice. These tend to make sense. There are other laws that inspire correct moral behavior. These also tend to make sense. Even some of the ritual laws make a good deal of sense but there are some that make no sense whatsoever. These are called hukim, a plural version of the word hukat, which means decree. So hukim means decrees. Any law given this title is going to be one of those that is just a so-called take it or leave it law that must be accepted as it is because it won't make sense no matter how much one tries to get it to do so. So how are we to justify a ritual law that the Torah it itself admittedly states makes no sense? Is this to be relegated to that ancient storehouse of rituals and mysteries that went the way of astrology or human sacrifice? While we're at it, we, should we throw in the, most of the Jewish, of Jewish ritual law, like the kosher laws or fasting on Yom Kippur or the laws of sexual purity? <clears throat> These are all relics of that bygone age when such things were in fashion, but have been superseded <clears throat> by the more rational rules of science and general human knowledge. Is there any place in modern society, Jewish or otherwise, for these seemingly antiquated rules and rituals that have no place in the modern world? And if there's no place for them, why do we insist on reading about them year after year, let alone hoping for their return to our lives in some meaningful way? These are important questions, and they are not easy to answer. They cannot be swept under the proverbial rug of religious tradition, although that is generally precisely where they tend to end up. These questions have to be dealt with once and for all. What place do antiquated religious traditions and ceremonies have in our lives? Perhaps there is an approach that can be used for this vital question. Perhaps we have been overlooking a subtle nuance that emerges from laws and rituals like these, a nuance that is easy to dismiss or to ignore altogether. This nuance is the unsettling fact that we don't know everything. We might think that we know everything, and we might pat ourselves on the back by claiming that whatever we don't know right now, we will figure out in the not so distant future. This is the constant and very clear rallying call of the modern world led by modern science. While there is much to congratulate ourselves on in this regard, there's also much to demonstrate that whatever it is that we do know is just the tip of the iceberg of an invisible visible world that we don't know. 
Nobody can claim to know what happens when we die. Nobody can claim to know how everything came into being. Nobody can claim to know the ultimate purpose of life. Nobody can claim to know the absolute true reckoning of good and evil. Nobody really knows what the soul is or even if it, or if it even exists. Nobody knows what is going to happen in the future. Nobody really knows what is going on in their own mind, let alone in the mind of another. If one really wants to get technical, we don't even know if the reality that we believe with, we live within and interact with is really there, or if this is some sort of grand illusion. There is a considerable amount that we don't know whether we admit it or not. It is things like this red heifer ceremony that remind us of this important fact of reality, even though we would prefer not to be reminded. We don't know everything, and there is something to be said for the idea that we never will. It is perhaps for this reason that the Torah includes laws like this, along with the old standards of thou shalt not kill or love your neighbor as yourself. Those are classic rational laws that make the world go round. But we also need these irrational reminders that not everything is meant to be understood. The Torah calls this whole thing a statute or decree to declare that it must be done regardless of how much, how much it makes sense to us. The guy who mixes, together, mixes the mixture together becomes impure, even though it seems like he should be the purest guy on the block. This is not because these things make sense, but because they don't make sense. This is the way some things have to be. This is a difficult message to present because it is the exact opposite of what people want to hear. They want to know that we have it all figured out and whatever we haven't quite gotten down yet will be solved at some point in the not so distant future. This is so embedded in the modern psyche that it seems to be almost genetically programmed. It is not easy to realize that the human mind perhaps was never meant to understand everything. Mystery is not as awful as it may seem to be at first. When one embraces mystery as the door to the infinite reality of the divine, it becomes not a source of fear, but a source of awe. Perhaps we are better off not knowing everything and not convincing ourselves that we have usur usurped the divine role once held by God. We are not God, and we shouldn't think that we are. We are human beings, perhaps only slightly less than the angels, but still groping around trying to figure out our place in the world. Maybe about once a year, we need to re be reminded of this uncomfortable fact of life. Shabbat Shalom.